Some years ago, I was on a camping trip with my two young daughters, then aged two and four months. They were playing quietly in a little portable crib just a few feet away from where I was cooking dinner at the picnic table. The sun was setting. There was a lovely breeze. The smell of the stew filled the air. <sighs> and then I heard a little rustling in the leaves just out of my line of sight. And again over there. And over there, and over there, and over here, and over there. And pretty soon I realized there were a lot of animals that I couldn't see. So I shined my flashlight, and there's beady little eyes looking back at me. They smelled the stew, too. <laughs> and I heard them getting closer. And pretty soon I heard them underneath the picnic table. And one of them brushed up against my leg, and I screamed, and I shined my flashlight down, and I saw... <sighs> yeah about a dozen of them all over the campsite. I was terrified. Look, I know they're only skunks, but I didn't know anything about them. Do they bite? What actually causes them to spray anyway? Does that hurt? Are my kids in any danger here? So I looked over at the kids, and there were skunks between me and my babies. Now my heart is pounding, my body is frozen, but with the adrenaline of that moment, I could have picked up a Volkswagen to protect those kids. Do you know that feeling? Yeah. Let me tell you about another mother. The year is 2000. We're in Manchester, New Hampshire, in the northeast corner of the United States. A woman named Mary Allerud has a beautiful little two-year-old daughter named Sunday Abeck. Sunday gets sick. She has a flu. She spikes a fever. Then she looks like she's got some kind of allergic reaction, so they rush her to the hospital, where she falls into a coma and dies. Eventually, the family is told that she died of lead poisoning. At that time, I was a business consultant, education, outreach, communication, that sort of thing. A couple of years after Sunday's death, the city of Manchester was looking for help marketing a, a lead poisoning prevention program. I answered the ad and heard this story for the first time. Heartbreaking. But as I mulled it over, it brought me back to my little incident with the skunks. You see, I could see my enemy. I saw what it was, I understood what was going on, and I could figure out something to do, right? Bang the pot of the lid of the pot with a spoon, move slowly and carefully, the skunks back away, scoop up the kids, put them in the car, we're good. Mary couldn't see her enemy. She didn't know what it was. She couldn't figure out what to do, and, and she couldn't fix it. Imagine her horror as she watched her little girl slip away. My baby from that porta crib is here with me today. <laughs> Mary's is in an unmarked grave in Manchester, New Hampshire. I got hooked on this problem, and I've been trying to make a difference ever since. I had a lot to learn. <laughs> Seven lead licenses later, Thousands of presentations, articles, blogs, books, read and written, and stories of the families and the children. Babies who are sick. No, not sick. Sick kids have some hope of getting better. These kids are poisoned, but not by lead paint. Lead paint is not the problem. It's when it deteriorates, it breaks down into this tiny little bit of invisible dust. Too small to see, they breathe it in, or they eat it. It gets on their hands, and their hands go in their mouths. Look, we can all be lead poisoned, adults too. The difference with the children is that between birth and age six, their brains are still developing. If we introduce lead, during that developmental period, science tells us those kids lose IQ points. They develop 
kidney damage, liver damage, ADHD, learning disabilities, hearing loss, speech impairments, their brains don't work correctly anymore, forever. And their babies, they counted on us to protect them. So how big is this problem? Well, housing data in the United States tells us that houses built before 1940, about 87% of them contain lead. Let me say that a different way. Nine out of 10 houses built before 1940 in the United States contain lead. Okay, but how many kids actually get poisoned? We don't know. Because in most of the country, there is no requirement to test them. Here's a map. Only the states in red have mandatory lead testing for children. The rest of the country either doesn't regulate testing at all, tests only in high-risk situations, or doesn't report the testing to us. Experts estimate about 1 in 38 children today is lead poisoned, maybe 1.2 million kids. But honestly, we don't know. That's just a guess. So we know some things about lead in older homes. And thanks to Flint, Michigan, we know some things about lead in the water. What I would like to talk with you about for the rest of my time is new homes and why you should worry about lead even there. That tiny invisible dust that we just talked about, that travels with you everywhere you go and into your home at night. It rides in on your hair, your clothes, your tools, your shoes. So maybe you live in a new home, but do you work in an older building? Do you collect antiques? Do you shop at yard sales or flea markets or, or on eBay? Do you have a home workshop? Do you spend any time in an indoor firing range? Do you have hobbies like stained glass or, or painting on china or canvas? If so, those paints often contain lead. If you work in automotive repair or in a marina, those paints generally contain lead as well. If you have um, hobbies or, or any kind of situation where you might be around old paint, say you buy toys or furniture from the internet, not all countries have the same regulations about lead. In fact, this last year, there was a crib sold on the internet painted with lead. Now, after a while, it was discovered and recalled, but in the meantime, people bought it. It could have been you. Jewelry, dishes, collectibles, that um, picture frame that you made out of an old window frame, a plaque that gets handed down in your family, grandma's mixing bowl. So how do you know which things contain lead? Well, there are lead inspectors, risk assessors, lead abatement contractors, workers, supervisors, there's lead safe renovators, dust sampling, soil sampling, do-it-yourself home kits, regulatory agencies. It's overwhelming, isn't it? It's confusing, and confused people do nothing. So let me give you five simple steps that you can use to protect the children in your life today. Step number one, test their blood. It's easy. He starts with a finger stick, like a diabetic checking sugar. It's, ask your doctor, it's simple. Number two, use a HEPA vacuum. HEPA, H-E-P-A, high efficiency particulate air. It just means a little tiny filter that filters out this little lead dust and doesn't spray it back into our room. Now, I don't just mean a shop vac with a HEPA filter or an open dirt cup that says HEPA somewhere on it. It needs to be a sealed unit that's in a, a good quality vacuum and sanctioned by the regulatory agency in your country, whatever that is. Right, step number three, keep all the paint in your house intact, on the walls, on the pictures, and just paint over it. Just, just seal it in temporarily with latex paint. That'll be fine. And then clean the area with wet, disposable wipes and any kind of soap. You don't have to spend a lot of money here. Uh, wet paper towels that you throw away would be better than sponges or mops that just spread this stuff around. Step number four, and this is an important one. Take your shoes off at the door. 
If you think you walk around lead dust all day long, don't track it into your house at night. And number five, I'm going to introduce you to one of my favorite little tools. This is called Lead Check, and it's available. It's made by a company called 3M. You can buy it on the internet in many, many stores. It's a little crayon sort of a device. has a white tip. When that tip comes in contact with lead, it turns red. Now, these cost about $4. So you activate them by breaking these little glass bubbles inside, shake it up a little bit, and squeeze the liquid that's inside out onto any painted surface. And when that surface, when that swab comes in contact with that surface, you can see that grandma's rocking chair contains lead. Now read the directions carefully. I don't have time to do a whole you know, class on how to use these, but they're really very simple. And um, once you try it a few times, just read the directions. There's YouTube videos, all kinds of techniques. And you can see that this picture frame contains lead. In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency has recognized these as useful techniques for you to use at home to test items for lead and also for contractors to use on the job site if they want to see what contains lead. And if I had time, I could show you that every item on this table, including, sadly, Mr. Dumpty here, contains lead. The challenge we have in the lead world is that there is no profit motive. Now, this is a very useful little tool, but I have nothing to sell you that solves this problem. If I had a, a vaccine or a magic pill, you can bet the pharmaceutical industry would be shouting about this from the rooftops, and you would all know. But without that, you don't know. I believe that there is one solution to this problem, just one, and that is awareness. All the fines and regulations in the world are not going to fix this. I believe in the inherent goodness of people. If we give you the right information, you will do the right thing. But you don't know what you don't know. We need an army of people out there talking about this, right? And you now are part of this army because you know. Look, there's so much information on the internet. Do an hour's worth of research. Do it tonight. You'll learn. You'll figure out some steps. Let me suggest three things that we can do right now to make a difference in the lives of our children. Number one, test their blood. Number two, test their home. And number three, spread the word, please. Thank you.